value of the steering committee of the U.S. campaign. Uh, our, oh, first, actually, let me ask everyone, if you have a cell phone and you haven't done so by now, please put it on vibrate or silent. Uh, but you can check Twitter and tweet about them as well. The hashtag for these sessions is ETO2012. So our next session uh, is on coalition building best practices. And uh, our session is going to be with Linda Sassoul. Just to tell you a little bit about her, Linda Sassoul is a working woman, community activist, and mother of three, which I think some folks can relate to. Currently, she's the National Advocacy Director for the National Network for Arab American Communities and Access, which some of you may be familiar with. And locally, she's serving as the director of the Arab American Association of New York, a social service agency serving the Arab community in New York City. Uh, she's actually, that's actually based where I live in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. And they're doing a great job. Linda is an alumna of the New York University Women of Color Policy Network's Women Leading the Way, the Women's Media Center, Progressive Women's Voices, Opportunities Agenda Communications Institute, and Linda was honored by the White House in 2012 as a champion of change and received the 2010 Brooklyn Do Gooder Award, which I voted for, from the Brooklyn Community Foundation. She's also a board member of the New York Immigration Coalition, which is, which is made up of over 200 nonprofit agencies serving the diverse immigrant communities of New York State. Uh, and that's why we have her speaking here today. And uh, it's worth noting that she's been profiled by PBS, Yahoo News, New York One, and The Guardian. Um, that said, I should also note that Linda, Linda said she likes animal print hijabs. <laughs> so uh, if everyone could give a, a uh, round of applause for Linda. Thank you. From Brooklyn, I'm very uh, honored and humbled um, to be here today, uh, specifically to talk about coalition building. Um, what I love when I come to conferences is I love when people come up to me and say, "Can I take you?" This is Jay Jonah over here came, and I always uh, say, "There's nothing that I would say up here that I wouldn't say to the front page of the New York Times." So feel free to tweet and quote me all you want. I do say some outrageous things sometimes, but uh, it comes from a good place. Um, um, coalition building. Obviously, the U.S. campaign is the national coalition. Uh, so, uh, for folks who are uh, been doing this work for a really long time, under no sort of circumstances am I trying to, uh, you know, undermine the decades of knowledge that some people have in this room of the work that they're doing. This is coming from my own personal perspective on the work that I do, um, and I've uh, emerged, you know, supposedly as an expert in coalition building on a multitude of issues. Uh, and wanted to share uh, my experiences with you and hope that I can bring something new to the table. So coalition building, why we can't live without it. If any coalition that's working on a specific issue or any individual church organization thinks that they're going to win a campaign doing it on their own, they have already set themselves up to fail. So that's why, that's, that's kind of where this is coming from. So coalition building, obviously, uh, this is uh, also very, uh, you know, kind of beginners. But coalition is basic. A coalition is basically a group of people or organizations that come together with a common purpose um, to, to work on a campaign or a joint activity. Uh, and the process of bringing those people together is coalition building. So people, uh, you know, start want to start a campaign. The first thing they want to do is like, we're going to go build a coalition around this without doing kind of the back homework. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done before you start a coalition, and I think this is where a lot of people miss the bar. So I think these are things that we really need to keep in mind, and it's been a kind of a learning experience. This is where I came up with this. It's my own uh, mistakes that I've made personally, the mistakes of my organization, and mistakes of the coalitions that I've been a part of over, over the past 11 years. First, is your the mission of your campaign? Is it clear? Like, do you even understand it? Like when you're explaining it, can you explain it in about 60 seconds, maybe 90 seconds? If you really can't do that, then there's some work that needs to be done before you start going. 
way out than trying to build a coalition. Um, when we are thinking about coalitions, I don't want people to think that I'm being selfish here, but your coalition, there's needs in your coalition. What are those needs? And based on those, those needs is how you bring your coalition together. So thinking about what is it that's missing right now, and how can you fill those voids in your coalition by bringing on partners, individuals, activists, etc. So think about what you need first before you go out into the world and build coalitions. And when I'm talking about coalitions, I'm talking about local coalitions. Because you're already part of a larger national campaign. I'm more interested in the local work, um, where you are, in your neighborhood, in your community, in the state that you live. Um, very important, the most important thing about coalition building is the people you're trying to reach out aligned with your organization and your mission. Well, the last thing that you want to do in a coalition is to sell your principles because one person or one group has a very small interest in what you're doing, but it doesn't fit the larger principle and foundation of what you're trying to do. And then why them? What do they bring to your table? You know, is it just another uh, seat to be filled, or do they actually bring something? Do they will they actually contribute to the wins of your campaign? And then this is this last point. I could do an entire presentation about this, and I've just learned about this about a couple of years ago. There's a professor at Harvard. Marshall Gans. I highly recommend that you look him up. Look at his curriculum. If there are trainings happening around the country, I highly recommend that you go to them. Marshall Gans says this, that in order to get people to connect to your issue, you have to create your story of self, of us, of now. If you don't have a personal story to share about why you're part of the US campaign or your own local campaign, under what circumstances are you going to get connect to other human beings to be part of your campaign, right? So you want to end the military occupation of Palestine. Got that, I got it. But why you? Why Palestine? It's, it, for some, even for me sometimes I look at people and like, why do they even care? Like, what, what, what? They're not even from that part of the world. They don't have family there. Like, why, why are you connected? Why is this so important to you? If you can't articulate a personal connection or a personal story, I will guarantee you it will be very hard for you to bring on people to work on your cause or, or your issue, particularly around issues like Palestine. That's the next slide. So now you're ready. You answered all those questions. You came up with your story of self. You got your personal connection. You can articulate your mission of your organization or your local campaign. You're done. You got it. So now you're ready. It, it doesn't come now. It doesn't just come. You have to invest time in building coalitions, partnerships, and bringing people along. And what does that mean? That means meeting people for coffee, going to events and networking with people, sharing your information, your email address, meeting someone up in your neighborhood. You know, maybe someone's from you know another state, but you are from the Northeast region and want to have a Skype conversation or a Google Hangout, whatever it is. Time, you need time to build coalitions and true and genuine partnership. Start local. This is another thing. I have people who's like, my parents hate me, my cousins don't want to get involved, none of the students that I go to school with care about what I hear about, my church wants to, wants to kick me out. Like, this is very important, right? Because if, if you can say that your local work is supported by people you love and care about and people who you are around a lot, it really gives your issue credibility. If you're kind of a loner and do this out on your own while you're still obviously principled and something that you care about and I'm not discouraging you from continuing to do it, but practice coalition building with the people closest to you first. And that's sometimes an area where I think like if I'm working on you know the criminal justice system, which is a, which is an issue that I care deeply about. And my own family doesn't support me, my own kind of local community, it doesn't really help me much when I go out there and they're like, but I don't see anyone behind you, like, what are you doing exactly? So the, the other slide I talked about, about preparing to go to those coaches, sometimes that also needs to happen when it's, you know, talking to your, like, spouse about their, your, you know, your grandchildren or whatever. The fact that you can articulate for even your own immediate family why this issue is so important to you and why you want them to join your cause. Now remember, everyone's participation is different. It doesn't mean that your grandchild is going to you know, be on a steering committee, but at least your grandchild is going to say, I care. 
or your sister's going to say, you know what, I'm proud of you for that. I really like what you're doing. So we're not requiring that your family is out on the rallies with you, but the fact that people who you're closest to support the work that you're doing and are encouraging you, um, I think it's very important to get you to the, to the next phase. Um, consistency, persistency. The other side, our opposition, their strengths lay in consistency and persistence. In order for me to join a coalition, if I see that a coalition is not consistent, if they're not persistent, and I don't mean annoying where you're emailing me like 16 times a day if I don't get back to you in the next like five minutes, but being consistent where I can, where you can direct me somewhere and I can say, okay, I know that I that in New York has a meeting every month or every other month and I know when the meetings are, I can put them in my schedule, I know what events are coming up for this organization, um, I'm watching them on Twitter, they're giving me updates, I'm on their listserv, they're really sending out helpful information. These are the kind of coalitions that I want to be a part of. So think about that on the local level when you're trying to bring people aboard. Are you consistent? Um, are you keeping in touch with the people that you brought along? Um, it's very important for individuals to feel like they're part of something uh, a local and something important. Next slide. So maintaining you know, this is pretty standard, but think about your coalition and who's in it. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, you don't need only organizations. There are people, you know, those like neighborhood people, like I have my organization, you know, when I want to do an event, I don't need organizations necessarily to just sponsor. I gotta tell that one lady in my community, and I can get a thousand people at an event because one lady who is not affiliated with any organization has that influence on other people. So activists, not just people who are activists. Regular people who care about your issue can be anyone. Organizations, faith-based, human rights, immigrant rights groups, people that care about the criminal justice system. I mean, the issue of Palestine, the fundamental issue here is justice. It's dignity, it's respect, right? So forget the whole military occupation kind of lingo that doesn't resonate with people, because some people are like, military occupation, like I'm in you know, Brooklyn, I'm in Bushwick, Brooklyn. What does a military occupation on the other side of the world have to do with me? But when you bring it down to the, the, the fundamental values and principles that people care about, like justice, that's where you start connecting the dots. So that's very important to think about. There is a whole list of groups that, you, that we need to really be thinking about. Civil rights groups, uh, atheist groups, LGBTQ, you name it, we need to talk to all those people, right? But we have to think about what do they care about, and what do we care about, and where are their parallels that we can connect. That's how you build a coalition with organizations that don't do work on Palestine. Government. There's a lot of my friends who are Palestinian activists, and they're always like, you know, on the left, they're like, no government. We don't like the government, we don't like the US government, we don't like anyone, Not, no government. <laughs> you know, I'm not one of those, unfortunately. And I get attacked for this sometimes, but that's cool. There are allies in government. And then there are people in government who know zero about Palestine, they know nothing. Our opposition, what they're good at, is they're good at constant education on the issue. They're always there. They're letting you know, like, stories, sharing stories, bringing people that are impacted, etc. You will find allies in government. And what we, what we know in this country is that elected officials have some influence on public opinion. And we've seen that on multiple issues. Islamophobia hate in this country. A lot of it has been spewed by government officials, by elected officials, by political campaigns. So thinking about who are our allies in government that we can bring along to the work that we're doing, not necessarily that they're the only ones that can bring credibility, but in some certain circles, they do bring some credibility. And how can we bring those people along? Corporations. We live in the United States of America. Talk about influence. Corporate influence probably trumps government in this country. So thinking about what corporations out there that do care about justice, um, that have potentially divested for other reasons and other issues that are not Palestine, and how we can align those and say, well, you did this. This is how this is like this, and kind of connect the dots for people. Sometimes people are not as intelligent as you want them to be. Sometimes people need to be brought along, and they require the consistency, persistency, and education, the personal stories, and this fundamental kind of values platform that you're going to bring to them. Academia. I 
academia I don't know, they bore me sometimes, but they do bring credibility to the table, they do research, um, they're quite influential on many issues, um, and, I, and I highly recommend, I mean, this has been done in the Palestinian Rights Movement, where you had prominent professors and institutions um, kind of endorse uh, Palestinian rights, um, as well as had some universities divest um, from, from, from Israel and from anyone profiting, profiting from the military occupation of Palestine. So thinking about how more we can, how we can engage more people in academia. So for me, the most important part of coalition building um, is connecting the dots. If you can't connect the dots for another group about why their issue connects to your issue, then that's it. The, the, the wall of coalition building just went off. Like you're not going to build a coalition system. You can't connect your issue to their issue, issue on fundamental values and principles, right? So I'm going to go. I'm going I'm to I'm do a case study for you today. I'm going to use a case study, something that's very dear to me, an issue that's currently my issue that I'm working on in New York that I've been at the forefront for for the past, actually for the past 10 years, but the campaign really launched, launched in the past about, uh, about a year and three months ago uh, based on an AP investigative report. And my case study is about the NYPD surveillance of the Muslim communities in the tri-state area, including New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York. And I'm going to share with you this case study to kind of give you some, uh, to show you where we where we failed, where we succeeded, just so you can kind of get a very practical example of coalition building on a very local level on an issue like law enforcement accountability and how that kind of connects to Palestine. So Associated Press um, in August of uh, last year, actually the day after I sat next to Commissioner Kelly of the NYPD at a at an iftar, which people might say I was a, I was being like an Aunt Jemima because I was like going to a mayor for already I thought of anyway. Um, I get that too. <laughs> Aunt Jemima is like the female version of like Uncle Tom, just in case it's like so I was sitting next to, and my seat turned out to be the seat next to Commissioner Kelly. I sat next to the guy for an hour and a half, and I'm talking about all these other things. I'm like, you showed the third you had film, and you know why did you guys do that, and whatever. And then the next morning, so this I just had this conversation with him the day before. The next morning, six o'clock in the morning, I woke up. There was an EP uh, report that that just broke that morning on August 24th that basically exposed the demographics unit, which was a unit of the New York Police Department that focused on 29 ancestries of. 28 of them were Arab and Muslim majority ancestries, and they created a very special category for Black American Muslims. So they infiltrated um, over 250 institutions, businesses, restaurants, coffee shops. Basically, the daily life of Muslim Americans um, is under severe limit. Do I believe that it's stopped? I absolutely do not believe that. So, this information was put in our laps. Um, it basically confirmed everything that our community has been saying for the past 10 years, is basically what the AP reports did. And there were multiple reports that came out. Like every two weeks, I was like, all right, AP, can y'all stop now until we kind of figure this out? But they were report after report, shocking. And for people interested in this particular issue, just because it's very interesting, um, if you go to ap.org slash NYPD, very simple, ap.org slash NYPD, all the secret documents, all the AP investigative reports are all in this one place, and you can read directly from uh, classified documents by the New York Police Department to the level of surveillance that Muslim Americans are under, to the point where uh, NYPD was joining, NYPD uh, informants were joining uh, Muslim Student Association on white water rafting trips and reporting on how many times they prayed, what conversations they had. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's a very interesting um, uh, report, so I would recommend on a side note to look at that. Uh, next slide, please. So we find this information out. It feeds, uh, you know, con confirms everything we've been kind of saying, and people have been writing us off, like our community's paranoid, and you think everyone's after you, and you're not really a target. This report proved to us that everything we've been saying for the past 10 years is true. So what do we do now? We sat, we, we, there, you know, where do we go from here? What do we do? Think about some questions. Who are our current allies? Like, we're not going to move forward on this. The Muslim community can't come out and defend itself on its own. Who are our current allies working with us on issues? Who in our community was doing law enforcement accountability work? Who in our community was focused on that work within our community? 
Do we have allies currently who are working on law enforcement accountability? That's a big question for us, like who are our allies? And how we worked with those allies, if there were allies that worked on law enforcement accountability, what did the Muslim community ever do? Did we join them? Did we work on stop and frisk policies? Did we work on police brutality work? Those are questions that came up for us. And then obviously, where do we start once we kind of answer these questions? <coughs> So this is the steps that we took to building coalitions in New York around law enforcement accountability. And um, you know, first, you know, we met internally as a committee. You know, we bought the, which is by the way, coalitions within your own community first, right? So in the Muslim community in New York City, we are 800,000 Muslims. We have Pakistani, you know, South, you know, different people from different parts of South Asia, you know, Arabs. West Africans, African Americans, converts, you name it, we have it. We have the rainbow of the Muslim community in New York City. We have, we have Shias and Sunnis. When were we all working together? Very, it was not happening in New York City. I'm, I'm gonna you know, constructively criticize my own community on this one. So we met internally as, our community, as a community, we mapped our resources, you know, what were we prepared to do, what, what kind of resources we had to begin a campaign, um, specifically looking at the warranted surveillance of the Muslim community. And then we talked about what were we missing? What, 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 were, what, what were the areas that we needed support in, right? Who did we need to bring along? Um, and then we joined already existing coalitions that we probably should have been a part of in the first place, right? There's a coalition in New York called Communities United for Police Reform, made up of different, you know, immigrant rights, human rights, civil rights, you know, the ACLU type folks, the NLG, and all these, you know, Make the Road, and all these membership organizations. We joined that coalition. When we joined that coalition, we didn't go in that coalition and start by imposing our issue, which was Muslim surveillance, right? That was the key here. The key of, for us to join those coalitions was to connect the dots between the stopping and frisking of blacks and Latinos in New York City and the Muslim surveillance and the NYPD surveillance Muslim community. So we didn't go on that table and say, we're on this table because we have a special interest here. We want your coalition to work on Muslim surveillance. No, we went to that coalition and we were quiet. We listened, we absorbed, we thought about what our contributions were gonna to be to that coalition and how we were gonna connect the dots on those issues uh, for this particular coalition. Um, and really uh, realizing that in any coalition, whether it's you know around Palestine or the criminal justice system or integration reform, et cetera, it's not just about you. That's the thing, it's never only about you and your issue, right? It's about how your issue connects to something much larger than you and your own campaign. Um, so, you know, what were some of the things that we were able to do with this coalition? So for example, we took leadership positions in this Father's Day stop and first march that happened in New York City that brought out over 40,000 people. And what does leadership mean? It means that we co-chaired the different tables. They had a great organizing model. They created different tables, the LGBT table, the, uh, the uh, faith table, the immigrant rights table, you know, all these different tables that were organizing their own people and then those people were represented on a larger table that was the organizing table for the, for the entire march. I co-chaired the immigrant rights table because I was the, the image that that brings to them, Palestinian American, I'm from Brooklyn. I represent an Arab American organization. But, I'm but I was chairing the immigrant rights table. So I wasn't chairing the Muslim table or the Arab table. I was chairing different people, and people were able to see me as someone who's contributing to a larger effort, not because I was Arab or because I was Muslim or because I was Palestinian. I was chairing the immigrant rights table to bring other immigrant groups based on my coalition, uh, you know, my coalition building experiences uh, over the years. Um, social media campaigns. We have trended, uh, uh, you know, multiple, uh, you know, hashtags getting people to talk about discriminatory, discriminatory policies of the NYPD and law enforcement in general, creating online discussions, and us also leading those discussions, and not only talking about Muslim surveillance on the impact of law enforcement targeting just on our community, but on people of color, on protesters, on Occupy Wall Street, just really connecting all communities and being at the forefront of law enforcement accountability on how it affects everyone. 
legislative policy changes. So the other thing also is that we need to have tangible things that are gonna be long term. So we have uh, in New York the Community Service uh, Community Safety Act, and working on a legislation in partnership with other coalitions called the NYPD Inspector General Act. Um, not that you should be surprised, but the New York Police Department, which is the largest law enforcement agency in the country, uh, does not have independent oversight. They are the only law enforcement agency in the country that does not have independent oversight. And they are the only city agency in New York City that doesn't have independent oversight. And this bill would create uh, an, an independent um, office to oversee uh, the New York Police Department, but they won't look at individual cases, but on policies and practices. And we made sure to include in that legislation um, uh, the, you know, surveillance, which is something that people don't want to touch because it connects to national security. So we've been able to talk our allies, connect to our allies, to ensure that they support uh, the language of this uh, legislation. They will not sell our community out by removing uh, language like surveillance from this local um, legislation. So the mission, goals, and objectives, um, again, the most important part of when you're bringing people along. Um, our overall, our overarching mission is the, is, uh, is the end to discriminatory policies of the New York Police Department. It's very simple. It's like the U.S. campaign tends to, <laughs> to end military occupation. Very big, you know, very straightforward, very easy, very clear. Um, and obviously that the NYPD does what they're supposed to do, which is treat people with dignity and respect regardless of who they are. Um, and the, the, that's the overall arching mission. So when the mission is in place, that brings people along, the heart kind of comes into it, right? They're like, oh, that's true. yeah. You know, our police department should be keeping us all safe. They shouldn't be discriminating. Like, no one's really gonna say, even the right can't say to us, no, actually, I do think that the uh, New York Police Department should be stopping black people. No, no, actually, I do think that. So in general, most people kind of come along. On the Muslim piece, that's a whole other story. They're like, oh yeah, Muslim people should be definitely serving on those people. So that's a whole other fight that we're still in with uh, the poll of public opinion. But on the stop and frisk, there's been a really big outcry from various New Yorkers, and people are across the country, they're like, that's some, those are some crazy numbers, and something really needs to change in New York City. Um, the package uh, of, of these five legislations is something very tangible. On June 13th of this year, we went in a broad coalition, faith-based leaders, uh, you know, civil rights groups. I mean, our coalition was already broke. And we went and stood in front of City Hall, we officially introduced the NYPD Inspector General Act. Our, our legislation already has 29 co-sponsors in City Council. If we get six more, we would be unbeatable by um, the Royal uh, Mayor Bloomberg. Um, so we're basically not going to move our legislation forward until we get the majority uh, so that Mayor Bloomberg won't be able to veto us. Um, obviously there are some concerns about our legislation around charter issues and things, but um, at least getting these city council members to support the legislation, it really allows for other New Yorkers to say, well, you know what, maybe they're onto something here. And the NYPD Inspector General Act is about how you message. We message this bill as a good government bill, right? So there are there are other legislations. For example, the end, there's a one that's like an end racial profiling um, legislation. There's one that, that talks about consensual searches, where we're basically saying that NYPD officers need to tell you why they're stopping and searching you, which is what they don't do right now. Um, there's another one that says that uh, NYPD officers should be mandated to give you a card that has a like, know your rights on the back and the name of the officer and his badge. Because a lot of times in those really hard situations, particularly if you're you know getting thrown up against the wall, you don't usually get to look at the badge number or have a pen. And now that the police officer should be able to give you something that you can refer to later and say if you have if you want to make a complaint, this is how you do it. Obviously, <clears throat> obviously, those are there's a lot of opposition to those bills. But on the NYPD Inspector General bill, we're just basically like, listen, it's your taxpayer dollars. Don't you want to know where your taxpayer dollars are going? Don't you want to make sure that this government agency is doing what they need to do with your taxpayer dollars? It's good government. So we're getting the good government people who are not with us on other issues being like, well, that makes sense. Yeah. Independent oversight, transparency. That's what that bill. So it's also about the messaging and how you uh, present your story to different audiences depending on what that audience cares about. <coughs> So 
let's you know, wrap up um, this conversation. I'd love to hear folks, um, first of all, a question, but I'd also love to hear um, some you know, best practices that you've tried to share with your peers. But <clears throat> I mean, coalition building is essential. Like, you, you can't win without it. So I'm, I'm sure that you guys have already got to that place because you're here and you're part of a national coalition. I'm sure part of local coalitions as well. <clears throat> Make the time. It's totally well worth it. When you build personal relationships with people, people start seeing you as allies also, and also as friends. And those people will come out when you need them because of those personal relationships that you build with them. <clears throat> this is a general coalition building presentation, but we gotta stop preaching to the choir. Like, stop talking to people that are already here about your issue. Like, we're there, we got them, they're good. We need to make this room into 500 and 600 and 1,000, and that's kind of where we need to go. And it's okay to talk to people who you think don't agree with you. Get into a conversation with them, find out what is, what, what's the point of disagreement, and potentially just the clarification sometimes brings people to the other side. It's happened to me all the time. Um, stay principled. I'm not gonna bring up specific groups of people's names right now, but uh, sometimes when I go to Palestinian protests, there are, there are a group of people, I won't say who they are, who are like at the forefront, or haven't been recently, but in, I remember when I was younger, they were like the first people in the protest. And I did my own research. I was like, who the hell are these people? Like, where are they? You know? I went to do my research and I found out that the intention and the reason why those people support a free Palestine or, or, or don't support the state of Israel is not because they give a crap about a free Palestine. That's not why they're there. They have personal religious uh, beliefs or an ideology that doesn't support the state of Israel. It has nothing to do with Palestine. So really making sure that we're principled and the people that we're elevating and putting at the forefront of our issue are people who fundamentally believe in our issue. So making sure that we stay principled out of building coalition. Do for others, right? You gotta do for others so that people can do for you, right? So if there's a local rally for Trayvon Martin, right? If there's a local rally around immigrant rights for, for dreamers, if there's a rally because in Rohingya there is a massacre going on, we need to be there for those people, right? We need to be there so they can come for us when we're doing a protest or a rally around ending military occupation in Palestine or when we're protesting Ahava or other, <clears throat> other uh, entities or whatever, or, or protesting a speaker at a particular university. Where, where are you and what are your other issues that you care about and how do we connect the dots there? Because if you're not doing for other people, there, those people are not gonna come and do for you. So think about that. <clears throat> also about when you're going to, uh, to another coalition, are uh, bringing people along. Not only do what do they bring to your coalition, what do you bring to them? You bring a group of people, you bring, you know, social media, well, I'm a writer, um, I'm, you know, I got like a million followers on Twitter that can help, you know, bring visibility to your, to your campaign. Whatever it is that you bring to the table, make sure that's clear at the offset so people can really see you also as an asset. <clears throat> coordination. Oh, Lord, have mercy, coordination. One of the things in New York State, this has nothing to do with Palestine, but on a lot of issues, the downfall of any campaign and any cause is the lack of coordination. So making sure that if you're doing something in your local area and another group of people is also working on the same issue and they're doing something opposite to what you're doing, we're gonna kill it, we're gonna kill the cause. And that's happened to us in New York City on like NYPD issues where Muslims have stood up and said, well, we believe in public safety and we, think, we don't think Commissioner Kelly is really a bad guy because they don't, know the they don't know the facts, they don't know the details. And when people see two groups, Muslims, Muslims, saying totally different things, it kills our cause and what we're trying to do. And on Palestine, if we have groups doing conflicting things, particularly in the local area, no. Build relationships with those, those people. Find out why they think their way is the right way and how we can bring those people along. There, there might be a, they might not want to get to come along with you, but did you try at least um, making that effort to, to bring people along? <coughs> My contact information. Um, please feel free to contact me at any time. Um, Email me if you're in New York, connect with me. Uh, I'm on Twitter, I run my mouth all the time. Um, on, on a multitude of issues um, that I care about, feel free uh, to, to follow me there. If you need 
Indian Palestinian Americans to kind of bring credibility to the work that you're doing. And depending on where you are across the country, let us know. I'm sure we know some Palestinians there. Um, and just really keep in contact. I think the other thing is like, I'm here and I'm on the stage, but I'm really down there with you guys. And I want you to see um, people that come to these conferences that we're part of the work that you're doing and very proud of the work that you're doing and very honored, particularly for those who are not Arab or Palestinian or Muslim doing this work. It really um, humbles our community when we see you guys at the forefront of, of the, the fight for a free Palestine and an end to military occupation. So thank you and I'd love to open up to questions. So really quick, uh, first note, Linda mentioned running her mouth on Twitter. I want to point out that while uh, she was speaking, others ran her, ran, uh, tweeted about what she was saying, so you were still sort of on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I was getting anxiety, like, you know, my fingers were big. <laughs> and in terms of the questions, I would say maybe we'll take questions in threes up at the mic. Is that, is that like, active? So we'll take questions and then uh, and then give them an opportunity to answer. Yeah, if you want to ask a question, just line up at the mic up here. Okay. I was just wondering if you had anything specific to say about coalition building on campuses, like any specific recommendations or strategies that you could see have worked on different campuses. Um, I was wondering, what were the first steps that you took to uh, organize within the diverse Muslim community in New York? And how did you say you guys never really worked together anything before, I guess? So, what did you do to like, overcome that? What was that conversation like? And also, how did people react? Uh, like in the stop and frisk uh, organization or what have you, to your sudden presence there? Was there any backlash or how did they accept you or not accept you? Thanks, Linda. This is terrific. My question is about sort of the particularity of the anti occupation and Palestinian rights movement, which has been from its origins in, in the modern incarnation in the last, say, 30, 40 years, has been fairly marginal in both its perception of itself and in the views of parts of the peace movement, parts of the anti-racist movement. And now, with the change in discourse, what we say actually is much more mainstream. But I think there's, a, there's still in our movement a sense of being kind of marginal and cautious. What advice do you have for us in challenging that sense of marginality and how do we move more in a mainstream direction? Thanks. Um, so I'm going to start with that last question. Um, I think that the perception of oneself is the most important um, thing that we have to overcome in order to move forward on coalition building. And I think that, yes, we always uh, view ourselves around anything around Palestine as already controversial before viewing ourselves as already in the stream. Um, and I think that one of the things that I personally have done is that when I sit at a table, I'm already a mainstream voice, and I make sure that I demand that um, at any table that I sit at. And I think that the this personal relationship building with uh, groups like the, in the immigrant rights movement, immigration has become a mainstream issue in this country. The dream movement has become a mainstream issue to the point where, not to say that this, you know on a nonpartisan level, to the point that you had a dreamer at the DNC convention, that spoke at the DNC convention. What did the dream movement do to get their point across the top? Consistency, persistency, and building with coalitions around the criminal justice system, pipelines to prisons. I mean, just getting ourselves involved with these other coalitions, I think, is key to that. And just really demanding like, like the, the respect and dignity that you as an individual, uh, first of all, deserve, that your issue deserves, and not coming to the table and be like, listen, listen, I know this is really controversial. I know Palestine is really hot, but I really want you to be. No, Palestine is not hot. Palestine is not controversial. And I think a lot of times that's kind of how we come off and ensure that you are a nation, you are an American, and you are already a nation voice. So when I ask you your opinion, your opinion is not that of a Palestinian rights activist. Your opinion is that of an American. And that my opinion is not that of a Muslim. 
Muslim or an Arab. My opinion is uh, an opinion of an American born and raised in Brooklyn. Just really thinking about that perception of individual and how you kind of take that in. On the issue of campus organizing, the same thing, the fundamental principles of, of coalition building on campus is the same idea, which is what other campus groups, first of all, exist? Map it out. You know, you're a student, you know what groups are in your school, right? Which groups are already doing work around criminal justice, uh, human rights, et cetera, et cetera, right? Start meeting with them. If you are a leader in a particular student group like Students for Justice in Palestine, have a personal, hey, can we meet in the cafeteria? I'd love to tell you more about what we're doing. Hey, you, are you cool with a film, you know, screening this film, you know, the coordination with the Black Student Association? It's been done on many campuses before. It's just about that first step of you finding out who those student groups are, who are the individuals and faces behind those groups, and having that first personal meeting. And then exiting out the groups that you know you don't want to work with, and the groups who are trying to work with you but don't align on your shoes. Cross them out. Okay, just map that out. And I think that that's the first step um, on, on staff strategies around coalition building. What were the first steps on, uh, when it came to organizing within our own community? And the and, and the, the stop and so the, uh, first within the Muslim community. Blacks in Harlem and Arab, light skinned Arabs in Southwest Brooklyn. We never worked together. A couple of individuals might have known each other personally. And that conversation, how it started, is by bringing some of the larger organizations that bring these groups together, like the Ventures of Shuna, which is the Islamic Leadership Council, talking to a few events. But you know what got those groups together? The young people, the young generation. Because we don't come with that baggage. You know, like we have baggage in our community of, you know, when black Americans say, where were the Muslims, uh, the Arab Muslims, you know, 40 years ago when we were going through this, right? They're right. But I'm not going to defend my father for not being there. I'm here now. And the uh, black imams really resonated that we were there when we're in it now, and the young people from the different communities are the ones that brought their elders together to the table. And that's how that conversation started. And our elders are really allowing us to be at the forefront of this issue. If you watch the NYPD kind of uh, uh, campaign, you can see that it is us that is at the forefront of that. And then on the issue of the soccer affairs, yes, there was a little backlash. There were people whispering, being like, oh, all of a sudden now, you care about stop and frisk. And, 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 and the issue that we, we brought to the table is that we are such a, a community that's always diverted. Like, everything's going on around us. I'm trying to explain people post 9 11 discrimination, talking to groups about entrapment of our young people by law enforcement, talking about what women in our community have to do. These are stories that people in other communities have never heard before. And when they listen to those stories and bullying or kids in the school system, uh, law enforcement, and dealing with the type of pressures that we were having as a community, people started saying, we're going to take you on. And then what we had to do, our job was, we had to contribute and we had to be there for them. And that's how they ended up getting on our issue. Saw us at the stop and frisk rally. They saw us at all the coalition meetings. Petition sign. You name it, we did it. So in the beginning, there was some, but we stayed in it. We were cool. We were we, we understood where they were coming from, but they accepted us because we came with well good intentions and we were willing to work. I'm Josh Williams, somebody from the Episcopal Bishops Committee on Israel Palestine in Seattle. Uh, my question doesn't relate directly to coalition building, but you did mention uh, something during your presentation which I think is terribly important. And that's how we create dissonance among those who are in opposition to us. One of the, one of the tactics we use in Seattle is we intentionally go to Stand With Us meetings. We go to synagogues where there are pro Likud gatherings. We listen, and then during coffee breaks and afterwards, perhaps having buttons and signs that identify who we are, we engage people in conversation. And if we get in a good conversation, we suggest coffee after the, after the gathering. And I would suggest that that's something that many more of us could be doing that's very effective in undermining the prejudice, the stereotypes that often are driving those who oppose us. You could have done my presentation. <laughs> Uh, let's get a question on the next one. Okay. And then if somebody else wants to line up, we can do three questions. Hi, Paul Verdine with Seville, D.C. Metro, Washington, D.C. Your talk was terrific. My question concerns the importance of showing empathy to the people uh, you're trying to bring into your effort, whether individuals or other groups. Uh, there's an old proverb that goes something like this. Um, the only person who can change your mind is you yourself. 
And I find in my work in DC uh, that it's very important to show empathy with people and not to uh, dupe yourself into thinking you can snow them with, your, with all your wonderful rhetoric and all the facts you have uh, at your command. I find that, that five minutes of silence where neither one of you is saying anything is often the most important moment in the conversation or maybe giving a couple days for someone to think about. What has your experience taught you in this regard? What wisdom can you convey to us about that? I'm Russ and Tom, people like it by which so I, we are working on this issue here and uh, we're looking into the uh, direction of investment, but which is a pretty bundled up and certainly the price and everything there is small, very small, but we're giving them an awful hard time where we can dig in. What I want to ask you is what can you suggest for us actions and things that we can do in order to make more of an issue out of this in, in our little town in Kansas. Thank you. Hi, I'm from San Diego, and our local BDS group is a spin-off of the San Diego Coalition for Peace and Justice, which formed right after 9-11 and has been largely doing anti-war work. Um, we have skirted around the coalition, the larger coalition has skirted around Palestine and argued it as putting it on as a focal point for our rallies. And finally two years ago that came to a head and we, a small group of, well, the majority of us were determined that Palestine was going to take a front and center role and um, in that it turned into a, a real inner fight and we have uh, lost a lot of members over it, a lot of Jewish liberal members actually, um, and our PDS our spin-off group is now larger than our coalition meetings that the people meet, and how do we repair that? So I'm gonna start out by uh, talking uh, about the, um, kind of that five minutes of silence that you were talking about. As simple as that sounds, just so profound. It's about active listening, right? This is one thing we don't do with activists a lot is, the, is listen. We want everyone to hear what we care about, what we want to do, this is why this is so important to us and never really sit back and relax and say, what do you care about? And just really letting a person go without interrupting them, or interrupting them trying to get a clarification about things and how does that connect to Palestine? Let people talk and listen to them. The most powerful piece in community organizing is listening. Um, on the faith-based organizing, there's a model called one-on-one. One-on-one -on -one is about taking a person out to coffee and just having a conversation with them. It could be about anything. It could be about whatever it is that that, that, that person wants to talk about in order for you to start their relationship. So active listening. Just shut up for a little bit and let someone else talk. So I, I, I really um, appreciate you bringing that up because I really have found that that has um, immensely helped me in the work that I've done, and I was not always a good listener. Um, on, on the question about, you know, how do we start small? One thing that I found helpful in places like that are really conservative or places where you're like in a small town um, place, I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, I went to Kelowna, Iowa. I literally had to take, you know, I got off in like St. Louis, Missouri, Missouri Air Force, so I could go to this little place, like Amish Village somewhere in Kelowna, Iowa, and I spoke at the school district. There was zippo zero arrows in that school district. I'm not exaggerating, zero. Everyone was white. I didn't even see one black person there. It was the first time ever they ever saw a woman in hijab, straight like, you know, like in person. And I went to the school district, I went to middle school, high school. Teachers, parents came out. I swear to God, it was an auditorium. Three times these people were in here. That actually gets the whole town, by the way, you're saying. <laughs> and I want to talk about, talk about kind of Muslim Americans and who Muslims are. And um, and then I went, got it, I went a little deeper into kind of post 9-11, kind of what this community, uh, you know. And there were people in there that were organizing who had already told me, just so you're ready, there are people here who you know, might not really appreciate you being here. And they might be present in that room. 
talked about being a mother, talked about living in New York, all this other kind of things that I could think about that could connect to these people and who they are, about schools, and I went to public school, etc. And they had scared me before I got there. And this one person coming into a community, people came up to me later, um, and, the, and then the organizers came up to me after that and said, so, did you see that guy that just came up to you? He was a guy that raised hell at our community meeting two weeks ago when we said we were going to bring you. And he had looked me up online, and you know, online there's not some very not nice things that are online, like I can't ask the guys or anything that you know, the Islamophobes have found. But anyway, my point is, start small. Bring a Palestinian. Well, I'm sure there's a Palestinian somewhere in Kansas I have to find for you. <laughs> Coalitions that have 40 members, 
Those board members, members equal 500 with the work that they've been able to accomplish on local level. So if you're a coalition, if, it, if you can't incur the coalition, be content with what you have right now. Continue to do your work, and then people will come back if they really see that you're still doing meaningful work, and people might reflect on their own. But make the effort to try to bring those issues together, and really listening and understanding why people walk away. <clears throat> and that really goes, if you think about it, in your family, in your friendships, in your relationships in general, but really more so in coalitions, um, as well as especially on the work. Uh, so that said, we're out of time. Uh, so maybe we can give a round of applause for Linda.